And on that note, I am honored to introduce our keynote speaker, a world-renowned physicist, writer, and all-around energy leader. He has been a thought leader on energy efficiency, technology, and policy for 50 years, and is considered the Einstein of energy efficiency. So I'm particularly glad to have him here at Princeton. In this role and beyond, he has been one of the world's foremost advocates for and innovators on energy conservation since the 1970s. He's received more awards and honors than I care to name, and I am conscious of not eating into his time here at the podium. I'll name a couple. In 2009, Time Magazine named Amory Lovins one of the world's most influential people. In 2016, the president of Germany awarded him the Bundesverdienstkreuz, or Federal Cross of Merit. And without further ado, please help me welcome Amory Lovins to the stage. Thank you. Uh, is there an AV person who can, uh, oh, I guess I can do it. Switch over the uh, projector. There we go. Yo. So I'm grateful for the honor of reporting to you some welcome surprises in the uh, global energy revolution. and. I invite you to hold these two seemingly contradictory thoughts at the same time. You know the part on the left. I'm going to be talking about the part on the right. Another aspect of this duality is that climate science models conservatively understate the speed and the runaway potential of climate change. But models of climate choice and consequences, at least as conservatively, uh, understate what we can do to slow, stop, or reverse climate change. Offsetting these two contrary biases, the race of our lives is very much on, the outcome is up to us, and despair and complacency are equally unwarranted. To see why, our story starts as it always should with using energy more productively. In the past 47 years, saved U.S. energy, about two-thirds through smarter technologies, has dropped total energy use per dollar of GDP by 61 percent with immense cumulative savings. Renewables, meanwhile, doubled, tripled, but with 27 times less cumulative impact. The ratio of headlines and awareness is the opposite because renewables are visible while energy is invisible and the energy you don't use is almost unimaginable. Yet saved energy is half of the world's historic decarbonization and at least half a future decarbonization. Energy savings are of two main kinds. One way is to save fossil fuels by substituting electricity or producing it more efficiently by the means illustrated in three columns starting on the left. So at the upper left, the huge conversion losses in red at thermal power stations are eliminated at the lower left when solar and wind power in green generate electricity directly without a steam cycle. In the middle column, uh, fuel combustion at the top provides heat several fold less efficiently than a renewably powered heat pump concentrating low temperature heat from the environment. And in the right column, gasoline and diesel engines with their big losses in red, are far less efficient than renewably powered motors in battery electric vehicles. So the systems in the lower row displacing fossil fuels with renewable electricity are several fold more efficient in turning renewable electricity into delivered services. But this does not yet include uh, higher efficiency in the equipment being powered or the building being heated or the vehicle being moved. First, raising that end-use efficiency, the kind I'll emphasize today, makes the heat pumps and electric vehicle batteries smaller, cheaper, and less mineral intensive. Upstream efficiency then combines with end-use efficiency to form primary energy efficiency. And by that crude metric, in 1975, U.S. government and industry all insisted that the energy needed to make a dollar of GDP could never go down. A year later, I heretically suggested it could drop 72% in 50 years. So far, 
It's dropped 61 percent in 47 years. Yet just the innovations made by 2010 can save another threefold, twice what I originally thought, at a third the real cost. And 13 years later, that's looking conservative because we now know that optimizing buildings, vehicles, and factories as whole systems, not as little piles of isolated parts, can often make very big energy savings cost less than small or no savings, turning diminishing returns into increasing returns. Vigorously applied, such integrative design, which I'll next describe, could quintuple global energy productivity by about 2060, or about triple it by roughly 2040, uh, as documented in this foundational paper. Now, making energy savings several fold bigger can actually cost less because it uses not more but fewer devices and not fancier but simpler devices, more artfully chosen, combined, timed, and sequenced. Familiar resources like copper ore bodies or oil reservoirs are finite and depletable assemblages of atoms. In contrast, energy efficiency resources are infinitely expandable assemblages of ideas, depleting only stupidity, a very abundant resource. Uh, a few examples. My wife Judy and I live 2,200 meters up in the Rocky Mountains near Aspen, where temperatures used to drop to minus 44 Celsius, and we've seen 39 days of continuous midwinter cloud. But our house does no combustion. That's so 20th century. Super insulation, ventilation, heat recovery, and big super windows that insulate like 16 to 22 sheets of glass, but look like two and cost less than three, make the building 99% passive solar heated, 1% active solar. Super efficiency added less construction cost than eliminating the heating system subtracted. So we save 99% of the space and water heating energy, about 90% of the household electricity, and half the water, all with a 10-month payback uh, in 1983. Today's technologies are better and cheaper. Now, the, the house wraps around the central atrium, seen here in a February snowstorm, which has so far produced 81 passive solar banana crops. Uh, and this house helped inspire several hundred thousand European passive buildings with no heating and roughly normal construction cost. Then a Bangkok analog saved 90% of its air conditioning energy with better comfort and normal construction costs, and nearly everyone on Earth lives in a climate somewhere between Bangkok and Old Snowmass. But wherever you live, integrative design gives many benefits from each expenditure. So the white arch at the top of the upper middle photo has 12 functions, but it has only one cost. Such integrative design let our Empire State Building retrofit save 38, later 43 percent of the energy with a three-year payback. Three years later, our cost-effective retrofit in Denver saved 70 percent, making this half-century-old federal complex more efficient than what was then the best new U.S. office at NREL, which in turn is only a third as efficient as RMI's net positive, no mechanicals, passive office near my home using about a ninth the normal amount of energy in the coldest North American climate zone. And now there's this Bavarian building reportedly using two-fifths less energy still. Uh, and yet all these technologies existed well over a decade ago. What mainly improved is not so much technology as design, the way we put the pieces together. And it keeps improving. The Empire State Building's owner aims to redouble the savings to about 80%. In Europe, IPCC reported these data from a decade ago with the biggest savings toward the right and the lowest cost toward the bottom. The best new buildings on the left and retrofits on the right could save up to at least 90% of their energy use without costing more per unit of saved energy. And the big vertical cost scatter just shows the business opportunity to conform inferior projects to best practice. These, the practice keeps improving. Now, for example, the Dutch Energie Sprung uh, technique can install a customized industrial prefabricated tea cozy around your building, profitably super outsulating it to net zero performance in as little as a single day. Nine classic old Brooklyn apartment buildings have recently been cost effectively super outsulated without disturbing the occupants for energy savings around 80%. Even in tropical climates, 
traditional passive building designs can keep you feeling about 16 to 19 C cooler. That's 11 or 12 from the building and the rest from a, a good ceiling fan. Um, and design, redesigning big mechanical space cooling systems can at least triple their efficiency, all with excellent economics. There's a revolutionary Princeton experiment four years ago that revealed a startling alternative. Purely radiative cooling kept people comfortable outdoors in Singapore without moving, drying, or cooling the air. Instead, in a shaded but open-ended pavilion, people stayed cool just by uh, radiating their bodies far infrared rays into panels circulating slightly cooled water and shielded from the humid air by a thin plastic film. Radiant temperatures of about 23 to 25 C in the panel could deliver comfort in air up to about 32 degrees at 80 percent relative humidity. Such mild cooling can often be delivered passively with no electricity potentially about eliminating the world's growth in peak electricity demand. Indoors, this Swiss fist-sized heat pump can deliver 6 to 15 units of hot water per unit of electricity. The Swiss electric cooking system uses vacuum-insulated pots and other innovations to cook better with two to four and a half times less electricity than induction cooktops. Industry uses half the world's energy and electricity. My team's latest 60 odd billion dollars worth of industrial redesigns typically found about 30 to 60 percent energy savings on retrofit, paying back in a few years and far outperforming the brown zone in the upper left where most energy service companies deliver disintegrated design. Our new build projects generally found 40 to 90 percent or greater savings with lower than normal capital costs. Just better pipe and duct design can save 80 to 90 odd percent of friction and therefore of pumping power, 97 percent in our house. If everyone did this, it could save roughly half the world's coal-fired electricity with paybacks typically under a year in retrofit and instant in new build. But this isn't yet in any standard engineering textbook, official study, industry forecast, or climate model. Why not? Because it's not a technology. It's a design method. And few people yet think of design as a way to make things big fast. To bring out friction, we simply use big pipes and small pumps, not small pipes and big pumps. Notice also that the tiny blue pump on the right is raised up on a plinth to meet the pipe rather than dipping the pipe down to a pump on the floor and back up again. This avoids four right angle bends. And to eliminate more elbows and their friction, we lay out the pipes first, then the equipment. So the tan chillers, originally in a neat row, get staggered uh, enough to straighten the pipes. We lay out supply pipes as if they were drains. We bend mines, not pipes. Thus, our colleague Peter Rumsey's retrofit of the Oakland Museum's condenser water pumping loop cut the pumping energy by three-fourths with a two- or three-month payback and eliminated 15 pumps that will never again waste energy and maintenance cost. And then repiping the chilled water loop and adding variable frequency drives doubled the flow and saved 85% of the energy. Or in big buildings, normally we pipe cooling tower water back to the chiller's condenser like this, but if we lay it out instead the way Peter does, everything gets better. Why don't we all do this? Force of habit, perpetuated by deficient pedagogy. So what does such savings mean for the three-fifths of global electricity that's used in motors have to run pumps and fans? Well, in a typical pumping system, from the fuel burned in the thermal power plant to flow out the pipe, many successive losses compound, so only a tenth of the energy in the fuel comes out the pipe as flow. But now turn those compounding losses around backwards from right to left, they turn into compounding savings, and every unit of flow or friction you save in the pipe saves 10 units of fuel cost emissions and what Hunter Lovins calls global weirding back at the power plant. And as you go back upstream, the components get smaller and cheaper. So the total capital cost goes down. Well, then we can make the drive systems about 80 or 90% smaller and at least twice as efficient by a whole system retrofit using not just the usual two improvements, but 35, of which 28 are free byproducts of the first seven 
That saves several fold more energy at about a fifth of the unit cost. This is not being taught either or modeled, but it can expand the potential fluid handling savings from a fifth to a third of all global electricity use. We can also save industrial energy by saving the energy intensive materials that industry makes. A couple of papers I published two years ago showed how smarter structural design can profitably save at least half the world's cement and steel that now release 15% of global CO2. That emits another twofold gain from better specification and application, together saving about three quarters of the concrete before we adopt any lower carbon materials or production processes. Let me give you a few examples of better structural design. Substituting tension for compression structures uh, typically looks better, costs less, and uses about an eighth of tons. Pouring concrete into curvy fabric forms, not rigid prismatic forms, can often save over half the concrete by putting strength and stiffness only where they're needed. And then the weight savings compound because you, ne you need less strength to hold up less weight. An airy 3D printed bridge can carry mainly its users, while massive concrete bridges support mainly their own weight. Here's a 3D printed stainless steel bridge. Most importantly, floor slabs are about half the total weight of a typical mid or high rise building, but a five centimeter thick concrete floor slab, uh, corrugated like cardboard, or a shallow vaulted dome can replace a 30 centimeter thick slab flat slab, it costs less, it saves three-fourths of the cement, and it eliminates the steel altogether. Well, then thin floor slabs and better energy design can save a further roughly 15% of core structural materials and three-quarters of the energy in a new mid or high-rise building while increasing net rentable space by a stunning 55%. How? Well, look at the far left. You design out that vertical meter of mechanical plenum at each story, uh, and that lets three stories with normal 2.8 meter ceiling height fit into the current height of two stories. Cost, complexity, and time all fall dramatically. Once you see this, why would you build any other way? So how much electricity will the U.S. or the world need? Well, nobody knows. Uh, the, the high standard projections uh, risk major overbuilding and stranded assets, and that risk is rising with the obvious trends plus further innovation. Uh, for example, in 2021, uh, efficient structural design emerged as a major opportunity to save steel and cement. In 2022, uh, <coughs> so did uh, low temperature ways to make those materials like electrochemical iron making at 60 instead of 1600 degrees C. In 2023, uh, <coughs> geological hydrogen became credible. What's next? I think we're rapidly moving into a tricky period where we need not just deployment, but also discernment about how much of what supply we'll actually need what is a climate effective investment, what's an artifact of inadequate modeling, and what's a shiny object with a slick sales pitch. Meanwhile, of course, full speed ahead on both efficiency and renewables, because as Ken Caldera said, end game details needn't constrain our opening moves. Even with even without most integrative design or, or those other innovations, RMI's detailed 2011 synthesis called Reinventing Fire showed how U.S. electricity use could shrink 25% by 2050 despite all electric autos and a 2.6-fold bigger GDP. So that's quadrupled electric end-use efficiency, and it would save kilowatt hours for a tenth their current retail price of the electricity we're saving. So we should have bought a lot more efficiency. Uh, for a comparison, the influential Net Zero America study assumed two to four-fold more electricity use, nine to 16 petawatt hours a year in 2050 rather than four, uh, for essentially identical GDP. Its impressively granular analysis therefore assumed many-fold larger supply than would be needed if efficient use were competed or compared with supply. 
in fairness, reinventing fire didn't exactly do that comparison either, but it did thoroughly analyze what efficient end-use electricity could do at what cost. What can it do in developing countries? Well, in this 27-watt electric household, Berkeley Lab used solar panels a third smaller than shown to power 7,000 looks of LED lights, a mobile phone charger, a clock radio, a table fan, and a 56-centimeter color television. Their super high efficiencies cut total capital cost by half, so you could empower twice as many off-grid families for the same money, and enabling cheap and very reliable DC solar microgrids. And if you want to invest to make things that save electricity rather than supply more, you will need roughly a thousand-fold less capital and recover it ten times faster. Lower capital intensity and faster velocity multiply, so you need 10,000 times or so less capital for the most capital-intensive sector, electricity, which devours about a fourth of global development capital. Freeing up that capital to fund other development needs is the biggest macroeconomic lever we know for development. Just buy megawatts whenever they're cheaper than megawatts and reward providers for cutting your bill, not for selling you more electricity. Whole system design can also make automobiles several fold more efficient even before they're electrified, making their electrification faster and cheaper and saving just the US trillions of dollars. Most of the energy needed to move a car is caused by its weight. And saving one unit of energy at the wheels leverages four or five units of fuel saved at the tank. So the carbon fiber electric car I drive made money from the first unit off the assembly line in 2013 at all quarter million units sold after that. And its carbon fiber, as we had expected, was paid for by uh, needing fewer batteries to move less weight. And then the fewer batteries recharge faster with less infrastructure investment, less energy, less emission. Integrative design uh, <coughs> also compounds or snowballs the saved weight uh, far more than other automakers had assumed. The assembly is radically frugal, uh, eliminates the two hardest steps in automaking, and is much better for workers. And the quadrupled efficiency, uh, equivalent to 1.9 liters per hundred, sorry, uh, yeah, per, per hundred kilometers or 124 miles per gallon, is uncompromised and brings many benefits like half the normal turn radius. Now, I want to show you a little eye chart suggesting what automotive efficiency can do through 14 examples. Uh, extra sticker price is on the vertical axis. Uh, rated fuel efficiency is on the horizontal axis, so higher efficiency is toward the right. And the official technology by technology analytic method that underlies U.S. and global energy efficiency policies yielded the Aqua 2020. 2001 high and low supply curves of potential U.S. light truck and car efficiency about 15 years later, and then their dark blue 2015 updates catching up with previously rejected independent analyses. But within weeks or months of publishing those official forecasts, they got embarrassed by actual market platforms like Honda's gasoline car, Toyota's hybrid, BMW's EV, by major automakers, light metal, uh, gasoline engine virtual design with RMI, by Porsche engineering virtual design using high strength steel with a gasoline engine or our estimate for a hybrid variant. And then in 2004, the base vehicles in our winning the oil endgame analysis for the Pentagon based on a 2000 carbon fiber SUV design yielded these typical light truck and car values. And uh, Let's see, then here's our second car spinoffs, aluminum commercial fleet fan. So the official component-based analysis misses the entire right-hand two-thirds or more of the design space. That is, highly integrative whole vehicle design can at least triple and at lower cost the fuel savings that policymakers now expect. The next game changer could be a couple of hypercars from small firms I advise, both production ready and now raising the rest of their production capital. Most drivers will not need to recharge this American 
carbon fiber two-seat three-wheeler or this Dutch metal uh, five-seat four-wheeler because they are about three times as efficient as a Tesla. So their topside solar cells capture enough energy for ordinary daily driving without plugging in, bypassing charging infrastructure and its electricity supplies. That's pretty cool. And they can be further improved, by the way. Now, my team helped Walmart's fleet of heavy trucks, the world's biggest civilian fleet, to save half its fuel per case in a decade, including smarter logistics. But better technology alone can profitably make U.S. heavy trucks at least three times more efficient, as one maker expects to prove this year. Airplane efficiency as well can rise about three to five-fold using these decade-old designs by Boeing, NASA, and MIT. Even today, Tesla's heavy truck more than triples efficiency with pure electric propulsion, 40% sleeker aerodynamics, light weighting that offsets the battery weight, and a two-year payback against low U.S. diesel prices. It'll get even better. Then there's this thoroughly flight-tested executive plane that could fly from New York to Stockholm with an eighth the operating cost and fuel use of a business jet, even before electrification, and it could probably scale up that te super laminar technology to about uh, 737 size, I think it could blow up everyone's aviation business models. Um, even those changes could soon be leapfrogged. NASA tested four years ago this 4.3 meter long structure, 59 times, not percent, less dense than a typical metal aircraft wing. It has the strength of bulk elastomers, but the gossamer density of aerogel. It's tough, damage resistant, uh, and eliminates movable flight surfaces because every part of the entire shape passively adapts. Uh, it morphs to optimize continuously for real-time flight conditions, just like a bird's wing. Thousands of such identical anisotropic plastic cells can be assembled by swarms of programmed robots, or grad students, whichever are cheaper, uh, <laughs> into an airplane of any desired shape, opening revolutionary prospects for light weighting, aerodynamics, and lower cost. So add up all these and a lot of other savings, and the oil and gas reserves, un unsellable for competitive reasons, look bigger than the reserves unburnable for climate reasons. So oil owners are even more at risk for market competition and innovation than they are from climate regulation. The cost of getting U.S. autos completely off oil has fallen from $18 per saved barrel uh, about a dozen years ago to around zero to seven dollars a barrel today, heading below zero in the next few years. So oil has become uncompetitive even at low prices before it becomes unavailable even at high prices. With electricity as with fuels worldwide, both technology and design are moving efficiency into fast forward. For example, prior lighting improvements were swept away as LEDs in a decade got 30 times more efficient, 20 times brighter, and 10 times cheaper, and ultimately they'll save about an eighth of the world's electricity. What else changes this fast? The rest of the energy transformation, modern renewables. LEDs backwards are PVs, photovoltaics. Solar and in aqua wind power have plunge their cost below the dashed lines, that's the cost of fossil fuels fed into U.S. power plants, and that has often made <clears throat> our old oil, gas, and nuclear plants uneconomic just to operate. You know, it's wise to sell customers what they want before someone else does, and customers have figured out, or are figuring out, that they can buy fewer electrons, use them a lot more productively and timely, produce their own, even trade them with each other. Dutch customers can buy electricity directly from other customers on this peer-to-peer -peer website of Van de Bron, literally from the source. A friend of mine bought his electricity from the guy in the upper left photo because the price was right, and it's a really cute piglet. And then he got a long handwritten Christmas card from his electricity provider. <laughs> what big utility can dream of such customer intimacy? Indeed, powerful disruptors are converging on the electricity industry from at least eight directions. And these eight Pac-Men of the apocalypse move fast. They don't just add, they exponentiate. 
They're not lone wolves. They hunt in packs. They multiply quickly. They can gobble up half of utility revenues in this decade. And together, they are creating an alien competitive landscape faster than most utility cultures can cope. In 2014, all central power plants were called dinosaurs. And the full quote is, too big, too inflexible, not even relevant for backup power in the long run. Who do you suppose said that? It wasn't Greenpeace. It was Union Bank of Switzerland. And now there's a whole new wave of Pac-Man coming over the hill and more behind them. Renewable power's astounding progress continues to accelerate. For 82% of global power generation some months ago, unsubsidized renewables, solar in yellow, wind in blue, have become the least cost source of new bulk electricity. Bloomberg New Energy Finance found that the cheapest way to meet a flat load is new solar or wind power plus backup, which can be demand side, storage, renewable, or fueled. And while costs are flat for fossil fueled power and rising for nuclear, they keep falling for renewables and storage. Bloomberg just raised its forecast of global uh, solar power additions in this year by 44% between last September and five weeks ago. It's exponential. China alone is now expected to install 209 gigawatts of solar power this year, nearly twice what they did last year. Solar power developers worldwide are investing over a billion dollars a day, more than oil and gas. The revolution already happened. Sorry if you missed it. Now, renewables also scale up in a fundamentally different way. Traditional utilities built giant cathedral-like power plants, each costing billions, taking many years to license and build. But now each year, with roughly comparable capital, you can build a factory that produces each year thereafter enough solar cells to make each year thereafter as much electricity as your cathedral will ultimately make. So, you know, just track the cumulative at the top. You've got a factor 15 difference just in the first 10 years. Uh, so solar output worldwide is scaling faster than cell phones. Big, slow, complex power plants can never catch up, and this is why renewables are now on the order of 90% of the world's net capacity additions. Let's look at a little micro example I found quite striking. At the end of 2018, coal-dependent Vietnam had a tenth of a gigawatt of solar power, uh, and two years later that was 16 and a half gigawatts, the most in East Asia, a third more than the 2025 target they had set just months earlier. Nine of the 16 gigawatts was on 100,000 rooftops or similar structures, and equi they're equivalent in output to building half the nation's coal plants in a year once the grid catches up. 72% of those, by the way, were installed just in the month of December, mostly in the last week of December, I don't think they got much sleep uh, before a nine-month window closed on a juicy feed-in tariff. There's a similar revolution emerging in China. Uh, Chinese rooftop PVs were not a thing in 2017. Five years later, they were 40% of the total and 61% of the new Chinese solar power. And worldwide now, one in every four solar panels is on a Chinese roof. It's amazing what happens when smart and resourceful people uh, can uh, start acting uh, in a very granular fashion. Now, all this means that we do not need speculative and probably very slow and costly technologies like nuclear fusion and fission, except, of course, the well-engineered and remotely sited uh, free fusion reactor already thoughtfully provided. Sorry, that one. Um, uh, Carbon-free power is necessary, but not sufficient. We also need cheap and fast. We need to count carbon and cost and speed. Uh, actual uh, <coughs> market prices and deployment speeds mean that new nuclear plants which save many-fold less carbon per dollar and per year than cheaper, faster efficiency or modern renewables, so they would make climate change worse than it should have been. Just operating, let alone further subsidizing existing nuclear plants, waste money that could buy cheaper options, saving even more carbon. So the more urgent you think climate change is, 
the more vital it is to buy cheap, fast, proven solutions, not costly, slow, speculative ones. So when someone says climate change is so urgent that we need all of the above, so we'll just buy everything. We're not picking and backing winners. Remember Peter Bradford's reply, the dean of utility regulators. He said, we're not picking and backing winners. They don't need it. We're picking and backing losers. That makes climate change worse. There are no proposed changes in size, technology, or fuel cycle that would change these conclusions. They're intrinsic to all nuclear technologies. And a climate non-solution is not worth paying for, let alone extra. In 2021, which was uh, nuclear power's latest full year of output growth, it added 87 times less global capacity than renewables did. In 2022, 986 times less. Last year, renewable output rose nearly five times more than nuclear output fell. Now, federal support may slow this transition, but can't reverse the terminal decline of nuclear power because it has no business case and no operational need. It offers no benefits for grid reliability or resilience justifying special treatment. And in fact, its inflexibility and ungraceful failures complicate operations in a modern grid where instead of forecasting demand and scheduling supply, we will increasingly forecast supply and schedule demand. Very different world. Uh, just if you like numbers, last year's global nuclear power generation was 38% less than that of non-hydro renewables, which were growing rapidly while nuclear output stagnated, fell below 10% of world electricity for the first time in decades. Over the past 20 years, seven more power reactors have closed than opened, or 57 more outside China. Despite intensive resuscitation efforts by many governments, the technology is simply dying of an incurable attack of market forces. And although China has the world's most ambitious nuclear program, last year uh, its nuclear power produced 47% less electricity than wind power and 6% less than solar power. Chinese wind and solar cost two or three times more than Chinese new nuclear, so China's 2020 nuclear investments about matched its cumulative nuclear investments over the previous 12 years. Now, we should be glad that our neighborhood fusion reactor is 150 million kilometers away because it does occasionally burp, uh, and such solar flares will sooner or later destroy any unprotected power grid, as most still are. The next solar peak is due in a couple of years, but it, it's now looking a year or two early and is expected to be one of the most intense ever. Against all these and many other threats, our best protection is a portfolio of efficiently used, diverse, dispersed, renewable, resilient power sources, the right size for the job, especially right on our roofs, not at the other end of a vast and brittle grid, and wired to work with or without the grid, as my house does. Making that resilient hookup with auto islanding our standard practice can build resilience from the bottom up, one roof at a time. Now, despite their accelerating failure in the marketplace, we are still told that only coal, gas, and nuclear stations can keep the lights on because they are 24-7, while wind power and PVs are variable and thus supposedly unreliable. But variable does not mean unpredictable. Here's how accurately the French grid operator in a stormy winter month a decade ago forecast a day ahead the output of the country's wind farms. They would do well to forecast demand so accurately. And forecasting has since improved so much that the East Danish wind operators bid day ahead wind power into the grid's hourly auction for balancing reserves just as confidently as they could bid fossil fuel generators. Indeed, we built the grid precisely because no generator is 24-7. They all break. And when a giant plant fails, you lose a billion watts in milliseconds, often abruptly, often for weeks or months. The grids manage this intermittence by backing up failed plants with working plants. And in exactly the same way, but often at lower cost, grids can manage the forecastable variations of solar and wind power by backing up those variable renewables with a portfolio of other renewables, 
all forecasted, integrated, and diversified by type and location. So in the hot and often humid state of Texas, whose grid has no big hydro dams and is only 1% connected to the rest of the country, a 2050 summer week's expected loads can get much smaller and less peaky with profitably efficient use. Then we can make, say, 86% of the annual electricity with wind and solar cells and 14% from dispatchable renewables, small hydro, geothermal, burning ag and industrial and municipal waste, burning biogas, burning obsolete energy studies. Uh, so now you've got 100% renewable supply that can match the load by putting the surplus electricity into two kinds of distributed storage worth buying anyway, I storage air conditioning and smart charging of electric autos, and then recovering that energy in yellow when needed and filling the last gaps with unobtrusively flexible demand. So this yields 100% renewable electricity every hour of the year with no bulk storage and with only about 5% left over to help decarbonize other sectors. So the economics should be excellent even at today's prices. And some grid operators do such choreography today. Uh, Germany, Britain, Ireland, Lithuania are about half renewably powered. Denmark's well over 80%, Scotland about 100 uh, And already they and some other European countries with modest or no hydropower are meeting about half to three-fourths of their annual electricity needs from renewables, yet without adding bulk storage and with superior and rising reliability. For Denmark and Germany, it's about five times ours. For example, the 99.999% reliable former East German utility, uh, 50 Hertz, was 65% renewably powered last year, heading for 100% all reliably integrated by 2032. So as my colleague Clay Stranger says, the operators have learned to run these grids the way the conductor leads a symphony orchestra no instrument plays all the time, but the ensemble together uh, continuously makes beautiful music. Now, standard models say that we need giant fossil fueled or nuclear plants to keep the grid reliable as it becomes renewable. But that omits most of the grid balancing solutions. Their full competitive landscape includes 10 carbon free ways, conceptually sketched here, to balance the grid across all time scales not just big batteries in magenta and without needing fossil fuel backup in red. Of course, your actual costs will vary. These are, are not yet the right numbers. We're still pinning those down. But the point is that bulk storage comes last, not first. So we don't need to wait for a storage miracle, although some are emerging. And the market isn't waiting. The first two boxes on the left, megawatts and flexawatts, are both about three times bigger than had been thought, but cheaper. So giant batteries, the costliest option, are valuable and often profitable, spectacularly so in South Australia, but they seldom look necessary. Thus, 50 Hertz, that ultra-reliable German grid operator, capably analyzed Europe's long, calm, cloudy periods, the dreaded Dunkelflaute, and with east-west interconnectors, those low renewables periods turned out to need backup power for only up to one or two weeks per year totaling about 6% of winter generation. That's readily supplied by existing gas-fired capacity, burning green molecules like hydrogen or ammonia, carefully made at other times from surplus solar and wind. The often claimed need for months or seasons or years of storage was not found, partly because this study included more of the 10 grid balancing solutions you just saw. Just European demand response could cut renewable powers under or over supply days by 90%. Making existing buildings more energy efficient can shrink and shift their peak demand. NREL's uh, study competing efficiency against storage conservatively found that this can cut investments by an order of magnitude by displacing long duration hydrogen storage and green electricity to produce it. And in four key U.S. regions, that supposed need for long-duration storage simply disappeared. Another big federal study just released found that aggressively decarbonizing buildings could save $100 billion 
each year in gross electricity supply costs. That's about a third of the total cost, uh, canonically, of decarbonizing the U.S. grid. Electric vehicles are now the majority of new two- and three-wheelers, 15% of this year's global auto sales, heading for at least two-thirds by the end of this decade. And meanwhile, efficient and electric autos are morphing from pigs, that is, personal internal combustion gasoline steel-dominated vehicles, to SEALs, shareable electric autonomous lightweight service vehicles. These two changes in technology and three in business model are all simultaneous, mutually reinforcing, vigorously in play, and supercharged by China and India with our vigorous help from RMI. Now, assembling all these opportunities, our 2011 business and design book I mentioned, Reinventing Fire, rigorously showed how to triple U.S. energy efficiency and quintuple renewables by 2050, needing by then no oil, no coal, no nuclear energy, at least a third less natural gas, that'd be more now, while saving $5 trillion in net present value, growing the economy 2.6-fold, strengthening national security, and cutting fossil carbon emissions 82 to 86 percent, yet needing no new inventions, no new no, uh, acts of Congress, uh, but with smart city and state policies led by business for profit. How's that going? Well, so far, the first 12 years of that 40-year journey are pretty well on track, green actual versus blue proposed, I think largely because the private sector smells the $5 trillion on the table. That's exactly what should be happening. These best buys are also the most effective solutions to big global opportunities that hazard every country's security and prosperity. And if you like any of reinventing FIRE's outcomes, you can support the transition without having to like every outcome or agree about which outcomes are most important. Focusing on outcomes, not motives, can turn gridlock and conflict into a unifying solution to our common energy challenge. Stimulated by those U.S. findings at the G20 in 2016, China's National Development and Reform Commission published its roadmap for China's energy revolution, not a word the party uses lightly. Uh, it details how China can save over $3 trillion, run a seven-fold bigger economy in 2050 than in 2010, but use today's energy seven times more productively, emit 42% less carbon, burn 80% less coal, and get 13 times more GDP from each ton of fossil carbon. This roadmap strongly informed the 13th five-year plan, whose energy authors happen to have been our steering committee, and then the 14th plan strongly continued this line. So if you extrapolate those on-track U.S. and adopted Chinese and similar European findings to the other half of the world, you'd end up with a two-degree climate target on the order of $18 trillion cheaper than business as usual, Reinvesting some of that in natural systems carbon removal could then get to one and a half degrees with trillions of dollars left over and huge progress on the sustainable development goals. I think making climate protection not costly but profitable should also simplify the politics. And a very powerful accelerator is capital market dynamics. So I'd like to go there at the end now. Incumbent energy suppliers feeling the threat understandably focus on the need for price to exceed cost. But many seem to forget the other part of the business condition, that value must exceed price. If competitors offer a superior value proposition and run off with your revenues, it doesn't matter if you can profitably sell what your ex-customers are no longer buying. These energy transformations can flip markets with breathtaking speed. On Fifth Avenue in New York City, in 1900, you have to look hard for the first car. Anyone see it? Thirteen years later, you have to look harder for the last horse. The horse and buggy industry thought it would have many decades to adapt, but Ford's Model T got 62% cheaper in 13 years. Car-owning households soared from 8 to about 60% in a decade. Three quarters financed by a GM and Dow innovation, sorry, not Dow, DuPont innovation called car loans. 
Today's solar modules just got 80% cheaper in five years. Three quarters of our rooftop solar is innovatively financed. Ford's and Edison's industries are merging to eat Rockefeller's industry. Horse and buggy thinking is dangerous but still common. As the late ex-oilman Maurice Strong said, not all the fossils are in the fuel. But DuPont's ex-chairman Edgar Willard reminds us that firms hampered by old thinking won't be a problem because, he said, they simply won't be around long term. Thus, the pace of transformation is set not by incumbents but by insurgents who are not inhibited by the incumbents' business models, legacy assets, or cultures. Moreover, investors flee before customers do because capital markets keenly sniff out disruption. And once they think you're in or headed for the toaster, they do not wait for the toast to get done before they decapitalize you and reinvest in your successors. Already, billions of dollars have prudently fled the fossil fuel industries as they hemorrhage capital, talent, and political influence. Before Putin's war, the world's top 16 listed hydrocarbon companies combined were worth less than Apple, and all the world's significant automakers combined were worth less than Tesla. Our my investment analyst, Kingsmill Bond, explains the capital market's brutal logic. He says, any fast-growing challenger will rapidly take all the growth in a slow-growing market. As a rule of thumb, incumbent sales will peak when the challenger gets to around 3% market share. Well, that was U.S. cars market share in 1910 when non-farm horse, horse sales peaked, just like these six later examples. Why does this happen? Because investors don't just want... Uh, size, they also want growth. And then they try to sell just before sales peak because then stagnation strands assets and competition drops prices. So this helps understand why the uh, coal industry lost three quarters of its global and 99% of its U.S. market value. That collapsing value was spreading to oil and gas before the temporary price spike from Putin's war. Now it's resuming, so oil companies must devote half their windfall to bribing skittish investors to hold their shares. Peak nuclear output, coal use, auto sales, fossil power, a bunch of stuff have already happened. Uh, and IEA says the 2020 pandemic slump undid energy's previous four years growth, CO2's previous nine years growth, but meanwhile renewables grew 45% faster their first trillion watts took 15 years, the second five years, the third, which was finished last year, three years, the fourth, we finished within months, two years. As BP says, it's, it's quite likely that peak oil happened in 2019. Peak fossil fuels, peak CO2 emissions may have two subject to minor fluctuations due to war or anomalous weather. So we're bumping along this plateau for another few years, and then fossil fuel use will enter an accelerating and terminal decline. Two scenarios for that at the far right. Those are from Bloomberg. They are similarly framed by IEA, BP, Shell, McKinsey, Ristad. In the US, every energy using sector has already passed peak fossil fuel, but this pattern of peak and plateau and decline is global. And Putin's war sped the transition by blowing up the fossil fuel era that underlies Putin's power. Europe brought remarkable focus and resolve to getting off fossil fuels faster by speeding efficiency and renewables. U.S. Inflation Reduction Act triggered as much domestic clean energy supply chain investment in its first year as in the previous eight years. And now cost, climate, and security imperatives, long claimed to be in conflict, are completely Convergent. Energy incumbents' experience makes them perceive change as linear. But the new energy reality, the new normal, is exponential. It needs a new mindset. It needs a lot of agility because it's hard to catch an exponential curve from behind. The U.S. shares in this rapid growth, but it dominates the old energy industries, not the new ones. It's not the technological epicenter of clean energy as it was for the internet. For now, the clean energy epicenter is China, where far-sighted policies have built about half the world's renewable energy and even more of many of its supply chains. Happily, this transition is rapidly spreading around the world. Just a decade ago, 
Solar and wind power cost far more than fossil fuels. Many thought they would never break 5% market share. Now they are half the price of fossil fuels. They provide over half the total electricity in leading markets. They will go far higher. A decade ago, electric vehicles were very costly with few chargers and no giant battery factories. Now EVs cost no more to buy than gasoline cars in the world's biggest car market, China. Tesla's base Model 3 is priced $6,000 below the average new U.S. car. 400 giant battery factories are being built. There are 3 million public chargers. So in this decade, solar power, which IEA calls the cheapest energy source in history, will drop its price by another half. Electric autos will win on sticker price in every major market and segment. Hydrogen will cost less to make from sun and wind power than from fossil fuels. In fact, that already happened in Western China two years ago. The main uncertainty is fast versus faster in this decade when winners emerge and infrastructure gets built. So the big picture is that efficient use, efficient power generation, and renewable supply are squeezing out fossil fuels. The dominant fraction of global energy still coming from fossil fuels is just as misleading a guide to the future as is the number of horses in 1900. Both are a stock. The leading indicator of stocks is flows. To understand where stocks are headed, follow the flows. Well, starting around 2019, renewables met all global growth in service demand. Starting last year or this year, they exceeded demand growth. The squeeze is on. Now, the official renewable forecast could still be far too low because nearly all the models do not compete or compare efficiency with supply, and they form renewable costs outside the model, not inside the model, so the observed renewable learning curves cannot actually operate. And this greatly understates renewable contributions in the left graph, yielding the gray violin plots, not the much higher red ranges. The third graph shows why. Solar cost is assumed to be many-fold above actual market prices in red. In the fourth graph, properly formed renewable costs in the red studies range the, raise the uh, renewable fraction, various proportions of wind and solar, um, to nearly 100% the yellow frontier, while overstated renewable costs consistent with the PVs in the first graph yield far lower renewable fractions in the gray points which still dominate the climate conversation. Shriveling the renewable fraction, of course, leads to a supposed need for the most costly and risky kinds of climate investments which crowd out the cheaper, faster, surer ones like efficiency or renewables. But proper modeling using actual market prices and observed learning curves does not call for BECs, major CCS, direct air capture, fission, fusion, and so on, because they are simply not needed. Advocates of obsolete technologies have an interest, though, in keeping the models based on theory, not practice. A couple of years ago, there was an important Oxford paper that used empirical price data in a deliberately simple and transparent model to examine three global scenarios for the energy transition. From left to right, a fast transition that gets the world off fossil fuels by about 2040, a slow transition in the middle that rapidly suppresses nuclear growth, so fossil fuels still dominate by mid-century, and a worst case, no transition on the right that simply scales current market shares. The top row of graph shows energy services delivered or useful energy. The middle row, uh, shows final energy, and the bottom row shows in light aqua the electricity used in currently electrified sectors, in dark aqua the electricity that makes green fuels for grid backup, and in dark blue the electricity that makes green fuels for heavy transport and industrial heat. The dashed magenta curves way at the bottom uh, show storage capacities sufficient to run the whole grid for a month with no solar or wind input. Importantly, no scenario includes any acceleration in energy or materials efficiency, which could displace a lot of that supply. Nonetheless, the fast transition is many-fold cheaper than the slow one or than none. And the faster it goes, the lower its total cost, because renewables get cheaper even sooner. And yet, significant asset stranding 
if we see this coming, can be largely or wholly avoided since depreciation plus service demand grow at a combined roughly 4 to 6% a year, and many of the assets are already old. Now, the standard assumption that a clean energy transition will cost more than business as usual turns out to be incorrect. It no longer depends on the assumed discount rate, as scholastic analysts have been insisting for decades. Climate policy has thus spent decades focusing on supposed economic trade-offs that do not actually exist anymore. Interesting paper, worth study. One last thought. The energy transformation I've summarized is not just fundamental, it's elemental. The first industrial revolution was the age of carbon. It built our prosperity and the world's mightiest industries from coal and oil and gas. But now that obsolete age of carbon is giving way to the modern age of silicon. Silicon microchips, telecoms, software turn people from isolated to networked. Systems from dumb to smart, grids from analog to digital, and perhaps from dirigiste to democratized. Silicon power electronics make electricity interconvertible and precisely applicable, replacing fiery molecules with obedient electrons. And silicon solar cells enable the ascent of energy from mining the fires of hell to harvesting the breath and radiance of heaven. So our responsibility, our opportunity, is to help enable the new energy system, not protect the old to build back better, to move fast and fix things, so the global energy transformation can move at the pace and cost of design and software, not of infrastructure, and can be not constrained by the inertia of incumbents, but sped by the ambition of insurgents, like many of you. Thank you all for your good work and your kind and prolonged attention. Thank you very much, Amory. Uh, we have time for questions. Good morning. I always appreciate the threads of showing the habits and the vested interests that are slowing the obvious, sometimes for decades, and then the economic Pac-Man that are inevitably driving this transition between fast and faster, as you said. I'd be interested in your observations as to uh, which will win, and what, in terms of climate, and what public and private actions we might look to to accelerate it. You mentioned one in China of smart people taking granular action. I'd just be interested in your observations as to which will win and how can we be on the right side of that. Nobody knows which will win. It's up to everybody here and everybody everywhere. But not everybody has to do it. Uh, as you see, a rather modest number of people has had extraordinary effect, and that keeps accelerating exponentially. Every, every week's data that come out, I'm astounded by how much faster it's going. Uh, notice that there are many spheres of action here. There's technological and design innovation. We often leave out the design part. Uh, new financial tools and instruments, new business models, uh, new public policies, and many of those are not necessarily top-down at a, at a national or international level. Most energy policy in this country is made at a state and local level. The utility commissions in each state are the, the, the biggest focus, but a lot is, is things like county commissions and zoning boards and so on. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of the actions that would be most helpful in policy are not much on the agenda. For example, the two most important that I've found would be uh, decoupling and shared savings or its equivalent, depending on utility structure, to reward utilities for cutting your bill, not for selling you more energy. We get that right in... 18 states for electricity, 26 for gas, and wrong in the rest. Uh, and uh, 
fee baits, which can be size and revenue neutral for buying efficient vehicles. That effectively arbitrages the spread and discount rate between private buyers and society uh, and can have, I think, a very marked effect on which vehicles we buy. Uh, although it will become less relevant as, as the EVs uh, get lower in sticker price. Um, but also there are some policies we don't normally think about that are arrestingly simple, like if you're a local or municipal government, uh, anybody that wants to build something needs approvals, put them to the head of the queue if they're building net zero better. That costs government nothing but to, but you know, time is money to a developer. Uh, or why don't we pay our architects and engineers for what they save, not for what they spend? Performance-based design fees. That has a very salutary effect on design. Does that help? Yeah. It's, a, it's a big spectrum. There are about 60 or 80 market failures in buying efficiency. Each one can be turned into a business opportunity. This does often require relentless patience and meticulous attention to detail because the systems are often more complex than they look. But we do know how to do this stuff. Uh, it is not normally what we teach or what many policymakers actually do but at least the knowledge exists. Yeah. Many of the uh, errors you highlight in these studies are, many of the errors you highlight in these studies are the result of a uh, presumption that economic decisions are analog rather than binary. And by that I mean if there are two identical loaves of bread for sale, one for a dollar, one for two dollars, uh, it, it won't go 50% by the $1 loaf, 80% by the, and it takes 10 years, immediately everybody will buy the $1 loaf. Uh, that presupposes... Depends how good it is. <laughs> well, if, it, if it's the same loaf, presumably. Uh, and electrons are identical. Uh, that presumes uh, perfect information, and people really understanding that, that both loaves are identical. And that's an education challenge. So in 2000, the venture community assumed that in no time, everybody would be buying everything online because it's a superior way to buy things. It's taken 20 years for online sales to reach anywhere close uh, those sorts of numbers because of the time constants of information dissemination and change of behavior. So it's principally an education challenge. If everybody read your book and everybody saw this slideshow, things would flip very, very quickly, almost immediately. So my question is, how do you think the education challenge is going, and how can that be accelerated so that the world transitions almost immediately? That's the reason a lot of us are here today. And uh, I think it's going better, but not as fast as it needs to. I'm particularly intrigued by uh, how do we rapidly spread integrative design uh, and as you may have noticed with my pipe and pump illustrations, this can be conveyed by an image or a meme, uh, and maybe it could spread at the speed of social media. Uh, so that's, that's one of 20 or so experiments that I'm, I'm hoping to do by standing up a little effort to try out 20 or so scaling vectors that we've identified at Stanford. Uh, and uh, I, I think if, if a few of those turn out to be winners, it could go a whole lot faster than it has. You know, any, any plumber or pipe fitter could look at that and once they understand what it's about, say, oh, I could do that. <laughs> uh, of course, you then have to explain to the boss or the client why it doesn't look like what they're used to. Uh, so there's education that has to be done at that end as well. Uh, but the results will speak for themselves very rapidly. Uh, and this is, this is not necessarily to go back to school and learn new stuff and let it trickle down uh, method. Some of the new tools that are creating some of our problems can also be part of the solution. Question here. My name is Jim Price, and I represent the Somerset County Energy Council here today. My name is Jim Price, and I represent the Somerset County Energy Council here today. 
So we advised the county on how to make our buildings more energy efficient. I also own a company called Comfortable Homes, which I am an implementer of all of these policies and programs. And I can tell you in 2023, I did not install one single fossil fuel appliance. I only installed heat pumps. And we are still making money and still in business. So it's possible to speak to the other gentleman's point. Education is the hugest part of overcoming the obstacle of what it's always been done this way before and why do we need to do it differently? So I totally agree with that. It is a huge cog and we try to figure that out every day on how to make people understand that this is not only better, it's cheaper, it's more efficient, it's better for the environment, it's better for the world and progress of the future. So my biggest, I guess, question here is, what are the best resources to find to educate the public as to, and now in my own opinion, the heat, the high efficiency heat pump is the best way to go because we're going to extract heat from the air, which in my mind takes us backwards. So instead of contributing to global warming, we're actually pulling it back out and putting it in the house. Well, and then with the efficiency of the equipment. The again, of course. Right, so we're reusing it. We're, we're shifting it and reusing it. Yeah. We're not gonna make it worse. So what are the best resources to tap into to educate the public on this is the better way to go? And whatever. I'd be willing to work with you or anyone else to work on that project to what, inform whatever, the world. Whatever people will understand and pay attention to and act on, uh, and that depends as much on where it comes from and how it's framed as, as its technical content. Uh, but what will most influence many people is what their neighbors and friends and family are doing. So it's, it's a, a, the, the mathematics of the spread of epidemic disease are relevant here. We want to increase the virulence of these ideas. And, uh, I, you know, I looked around for literature on uh, what makes ideas spread quickly. Uh, and there seem to be analogies to what makes hardware like photovoltaics spread quickly, but there, there, I couldn't find good literature on what makes ideas spread quickly. And if, if any of you can steer me to some of that, I would appreciate it. Um, uh, yes, sorry. Um, should I start? Okay, yes. My question was about um, uh, Jevons' paradox. So I'm uh, Salim Ali from the University of Delaware, and uh, I often use your uh, readings uh, with my students about your critique of Jevons' paradox, but the environmentalist community is still very intent and, uh, you know, in terms of the rebound effect and that doing all this efficiency will actually lead to more consumption and that you, you might not actually get the outcome you want. So I was wondering if you can address that. And then uh, related to that, to some degree, the Chinese issue of, you know, how have they seen the Jevons paradox be manifest? Because as you have noted, they've, they've done quite well in this regard. Well. This is a, a much longer conversation. There are five layers of rebound of which only the macroeconomic stimulus is really relevant. The, the usual uh, arguments about making an energy service cheaper so people buy more of it or giving them more disposable income so they buy more stuff uh, which embodies energy, those are true but very small effects except in the most pathological cases. They're typically a few percent. They're often harder, impossible to measure. And the argument as put forth about every 10 years by some economist who rediscovers it or some advocate who wants to use it to beat up on efficiency, uh, those, those arguments are in general not valid. There's a, a good literature saying so. And uh, it's just a distraction from getting on with the job. We do count in, for example, reinventing fire, rebound to the extent supported by uh, competent literature, and it's, it's a few percent effect and has no, no noticeable uh, effect on the conclusions. And last question to Emily Carter or Sarah, can you provide the microphone, whom I will be introducing properly in a few minutes. That's fine. Thank you, this was, this was really stimulating, excellent. So 
actually coming back to Paul Mater, who didn't introduce himself, but is responsible for this beautiful building that we're in. Thank you, Paul. Um, sorry. Uh, did everyone hear me thank Paul Mater? Yes, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, so coming back to, to Paul's point, but actually a slightly different one, I mean, obviously, education is extremely important for adoption. I think your idea of, of social media is, is probably the most efficient way in the world we live in to get those ideas out. My question to you is about, I think energy efficiency has been the low-hanging fruit for a very long time um, in terms of this transition. But to what extent are there barriers, not just in terms of educating consumers or educating the plumbers, but in terms of building codes? And in terms of um, issues with respect to, because because as we know, at least in the United States, the uh, builders, national builders associations, and and the codes are for good reason quite conservative to ado adopt new technologies. And so some of these, I I, I assume, are completely drop in, like uh, high efficiency heat pumps, but others like the corrugated design you had on the on using less cement, you know, I can imagine. That, that, that that's still a bottleneck. And how do you think about then accelerating the adoption of all of these ways of improving efficiency in our infrastructure, uh, um, given the potential bottlenecks that, uh, such as conservative, um, co you know, in some sense, rightly from the point of view of safety, uh, um, uh, very conservative notions in no. our building well, uh, codes. They the, the home building industry in this country is, on the whole, dynamically conservative, that is, actively resists innovation, with some important exceptions. Uh, and uh, I like to work with the exceptions and let the others figure it out in the market, uh, <clears throat> rather than spending a lot of time on laggards. Uh, the, uh, some, yeah, I'm some, sure you some, can find. I'm sure you can find converts that want to do the building. I'm asking, yeah, are remember, they? Is there a bottleneck? Are they stopped from building a bridge in a new way, a 3D printed bridge, or the, this corrugation, oh, or whatever, because of the existing codes? And and how do you convince yes, often, and work with the governments, both local, as you said, which is incredibly that, important, that's, but that's nationally? Where, that's where there's an important government role in uh, probably doing flagship projects where they can facilitate the regulatory. Uh, lubrication where, where needed. I'd, uh, as part of the structural design work, where I, I, I'm not a, actually a structural engineer, uh, but I pulled together a, a high quality but very fragmented literature no one had assembled before and was quite astonished by what I found. I then interviewed three of the top structural engineers in the world and they all identified exactly the problem you described that they can only do adventurous designs for clients they've worked with for 30 years, so the client has confidence the thing won't fall down, even if it looks weird. Uh, but by then, both you and the client are about to retire. Uh, so uh, I think uh, as just as much as tension structures and tension bridges in particular have now become widely accepted, uh, we do need uh, more uh, local and higher governments to step up and build their own stuff that way. And I, I also think there's a lot of scope for what I described in a companion paper in Slo MIT Sloan Management Review uh, to do new business models. For example, if, if you're a cement company, instead of selling tons of cement to build a bridge, uh, how about you sign up the best designer and builder uh, to build it and lease the resulting structural service to me, the customer, uh, and I will pay you for how safely and efficiently we can carry payload across the bridge, because that's what I want. I don't particularly want a bunch of stuff. But then you have moved the cement from uh, your revenue source to a cost item, uh, and the less cement you sell, the more money we'll both make, right? And there's a huge first mover advantage in this sort of business model because you can sign up all the best practitioners first. Uh, anyway, there are about half a dozen new business models 
that's a classic solutions economy one that I think could uh, profoundly affect the speed of spread. And it only takes one company in each sector to do that. Uh, so I am hoping, well, actually, I, I tried that one over dinner 10 years ago on the chairman of a very large cement company. He listened carefully and said, yes, good idea. I have 300 people working on that. But now I need to find out what happened. But even more, you need to work with, with the federal government to get them to incentivize that policy. For example. Yeah. Yes, or another one. Uh, I'm, I'm starting to talk to major players in aviation about a platinum carrot where a powerful customer group will say, we want at least quadruple deficiency airplanes. Here's the spec list for several sizes. And whoever first gets us that plane on the market, we will undertake collectively to buy X copies a year for Y years at price Z. We just removed your market risk. Go for it. And, and there will be a consolation prize for the runner-up. This, I think, would profoundly change the uh, risk appetite and uh, elicit the most creative people within those, those conservative cultures. Thank you very much, Amory.